This is Cindy Ingram, and welcome to the Art Class Curator Podcast, where we're taking art out of the dark with thoughtful explorations and in-depth interviews designed to ignite curiosity and delight in art classrooms everywhere. I am thrilled to welcome Jim O'Donnell from Kill Your Color Wheels to the podcast. In this episode, Jim and I dish about our shared hatred of the elements and principles of art. Yeah, you heard it. How giving grades can stifle creativity and why assessing effort in creative exercises can be troublesome. I hope you leave this conversation as inspired and energized as I did. I am so happy to welcome Jim O'Donnell to the podcast. Welcome, Jim. Hi, Cindy. Thanks so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Awesome. I've been following your website, Kill Your Color Wheels, which if you guys listening have not visited, it's really fascinating. There's a lot of really awesome in-depth information. So as we get started, can you please tell us a little bit more about you and your experiences? Sure. So my background starts in 2005 when I started teaching art. I've taught elementary and middle school art, and I did that for a few years. All that time I was continuing to kind of work on my own artwork when I'd come home. And so eventually I went on to pursue an MFA for a little while where I got to teach college classes for studio art. After that wrapped up, I had the opportunity to, I was very fortunate to be able to become a coordinator for a very small art education program. So I taught the classes, supervised the student teachers, visited teachers all over the area, and was also teaching studio art. I did that for several years. And so now I'm actually working on a PhD studying creativity and working with classroom teachers, which I love. And, you know, so I've been in the field of art education. I've been fortunate to have these different points of view, you know, all sort of surrounding the same topic, right? So, and all that for me started, you know, asking about my background with a art teacher I had named Sheila Kremelman. And I'm not actually a product of art education per se. I didn't really have an art class until almost I was done with high school, even though I was like a self-identified artist, right? So when I got to college, I wasn't even thinking about doing art. I was going to major in advertising. And I was taking some art classes there where they didn't even have a major. It was just some art classes. And, and I had this incredible teacher who I was in a class with just regular folks who were just kind of interested in art. And they didn't know I had background in it. And watching what she did with these kids and helping them trans, watching these transformations they'd have in, in their art class, learning how to express themselves and to be creative and exploring that was just tremendous. And I can remember a friend of mine, Joe Saragusa, he said, uh, I don't know if I can go back to work in my dad's pizza shop after this. And that's a life changing, you know, experience. So ever since then, I've been inspired to inspire. So I decided to become part of the solution rather than the problem, I say, and went into teaching art. Oh, I love that. Yeah, the such power teachers have, you know, mm -hmm. to shape the lives of their students. It's really yeah. amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and what we should because I think a lot of my journey is too was inspired by one teacher who kind of showed me art history and I didn't mm -hmm. know art history before. And when I was introduced to that, I just, I mean, it just changed my world. And had he not really fought for that at my high school and offered that as a class, he didn't have to offer that as a class. And I don't think I would have eventually discovered, I think it would have drawn me in eventually somehow, but yeah. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I mean, I've dedicated my life to it. I think I would have figured it out eventually. I used to go to Disney movies and like cry my eyes out. I think that was my, that was my artwork before I actually saw other art. Is oh, I like, still do that. <laughs> yeah, <me> <laughs> but that's tremendous that you had such a positive experience with yeah, art history yeah most people don't and so it's sad yeah but i'm glad yeah. you are changing that yes indeed okay so tell us about kill your color wheels and what prompted you to start that and sort of what the whole philosophy is around that yeah so kill your color wheels is definitely a provocative title and for me you know, it sort of embodies what I think we should be doing more of in art education. Let me take an example first. So my the class I just finished up with was early childhood educators, and I teach a course helping them to learn how to integrate art, right, and creativity in their teaching. At the beginning of that class, 65% of the students thought that everyone had the potential to be creative. And by the end of the class, we got to 96%, right? So I feel very good about that. But at the same time, these are people who signed up for a visual art integration class. This is a self-selected group, right? And, only, and slightly more than half, two thirds of them thought that everyone was actually creative. And all the time from these kids, I heard, I'm not creative. I'm not creative. I never thought I was creative. So, okay. So getting back to Killer Color was if these students who are well-educated, they're about to become teachers, they're going to go into their own classrooms and hopefully support 
creative students and creativity in their classrooms, if only two thirds or a half of them think that all of their students even have the potential to be creative, we can do better than that. So I think, you know, for me, kill your color wheels means that we should maybe doing less of focusing on helping students figure out what colors might go well together and, and really focus in on helping students find and make meaning through art, right? So that's what it's all about for me is just really getting to what's most important. And for me, that's meaning. That's meaning making. Yeah. And that is what art is all about. Art making and then looking at art. It's all about connection and expression and context and the mm-hmm. actual like elements and principles of art are used as tools for meaning. That is why they are you <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah. my one of my most popular blog posts and it has the most controversy too is called why i hate the elements and principles of art <laughs> yeah i love that and, one <laughs> yeah, it's like, every time i post it on facebook it gets all sorts of uh, <laughs> I, I know <laughs> yeah that's um, great so do you also hate the elements and principles of art? <laughs> i you know it's a love-hate relationship right yeah. so you know i it, it's complicated um they, for me, represent sort of the grammar of art, right? So if I was teaching, one of my favorite books I read early on in my teaching career was a book called Walking on Water by Derek Jensen. And he's a writing teacher and he taught college writing. He taught writing in prisons. He taught writing it, it for young people. And, you know, he focused in that class on if he wanted students to enjoy writing and to be intrinsically motivated and to become better writers, guess what they did? They wrote, they, did. <laughs> they just wrote, you know, and they learned how to express themselves and how to get out, get what's inside outside. Right. And uh, so for me that, you know, it's not a mystery in that sense, when it comes to art, what I want my students to be doing, I don't want them to focus on sort of the grammar of art. You know, that's, it's useful for when we're talking about art. Sure. It has its uses, but you know, the way it it comes across in some classes, it's kind of like the end all be all of what art education is. And, And there's so much more to art education than just those bits and pieces, right? So, you know, so one example that's, I think, very prevalent today is slows, right? So these student learning outcomes, teachers have had to write across the country and rather suddenly, and based on my experience, I got to witness teachers struggling through this process. You know, essentially the idea is that you should have a pre-test and a post-test. To me, that makes a lot of sense, right? Like find out what they know at the beginning, find out what they know at the end. Did anything happen, right? So (laughs) did you make a difference? But, you know, these teachers, these poor teachers, they have no training in test design. Frankly, 99 in my, like, no, Almost nobody gets training in how to design these things when they're in school, even if they go through a certification program. So it's like you're asking art teachers suddenly to come up with a test that's going to have something to do with how they're evaluated or how they're judged by, you know, at least how they feel about themselves. You know, it doesn't surprise me that based on all of those, you know, conflating events that you're going to have this sort of focus on a lowest common denominator. What's the easiest thing to look for? How can I make absolutely sure they're going to get some? And, you know, that's just kind of unfortunate to me because there's, again, it's just, there's just so much more that they could be looking for and that they should be looking for. And, and ultimately it just, it kind of short changes us, right? Like if that's what our administrators think that we're doing, we're just focusing on, you know, there's thick lines and thin lines. And I mean, the, you know, I think we're not doing maybe as good of a job as we could as, as showing off the real power of what we do with our students, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I feel like it's used like as a crutch and as a way to validate that we're actually teaching real content. I think, you know, when, when you've got math teachers and English teachers who have these tested subjects and an art teacher, I think I've seen and art teachers feel like their content area is not respected well enough. So they're like, oh, well, we do have content. We have relevance principles. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And I'm like, well, yes, we do, but... (laughs) also something that separates us from those subjects yes. that is greater and more powerful and more meaningful for a student throughout their history, their entire future. Yeah. And yeah. Embracing that. I love that you said that because I mean, I think about, you know, like uh, linguistics actually, like how people learn language. And there's this um, linguist um, that was influential when I was in school named Stephen Krashen. And he talked about how when infants are learning language, they don't start with the grammar, right? They start with meaningful utterances. Uh, Mm -hmm. I want this. I want that. Like they're trying to communicate something. So I always start with that in my, you know, in my classroom, as far as focusing on the meaning that the students are trying to express and what they can express. And, you know, unfortunately that is something that kind of gets in the, I want to focus on that meaning. I want us to be different from the other subjects, getting back to what you were saying, because, you know, 
being able to put what we do on a multiple choice test, making us more like other subjects is not our strength. Our strength is subjectivity. It is expression. It is the human experience, right? So not all that's going to be fit on a multiple choice test. And that's okay. (laughs) That's a good thing. (laughs) Well, I love how you connected it to writing too, because when every writing class I've taken or every you know, copywriting or even, you know, creative writing, they always start with just get it out. You know, Mm -hmm. don't worry about the grammar. Don't worry about how the sentence is structured. Don't worry about run-ons. Just get the information onto the paper, Mm -hmm. get the meaning, get the emotion, get the feeling, and then you can worry about the rest. And I had never connected that with art making before in that context of the elements principles. And I love that. Like, let's start with getting the meaning out. And then we can think about, well, what can we do to make this more meaningful, more powerful now that we've got the essence out? Like what, then maybe then you can pull in the elements principles to make it pop more and make that meaning stand out more and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I love that. That's kind of how you refine it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, what, you know, expressing yourself can be very anxiety, you know, producing, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, it's a vulnerable thing to be. And a lot of times I like to start with my students in how can we do this badly? Like if we are going to study color, right? Like I actually like to have students like, can you find a color combination that like ugliest combination you can possibly find? And without a doubt, like somebody in the class would be like, no, I like that. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like, you know, I just love that idea of just, um, you know, let's just get it out. It doesn't matter what it looks like. Make it messy. That's fine. Do it bad even at first and then, you know, improve it. Right. Oh, I love that. And they also do that in the software world. My husband is in this in software field. Cool. And one of the things they do is they, the slogan they have is fail fast. You know, yeah, that comes from Pixar, doesn't it? I think. Oh yeah, it probably does. It probably yeah. does. And so it's like, you just don't worry about it. Just get out there, throw your stuff out there and see what sticks and, and fail. And that's so yeah. hard because we're teaching kids not to fail in every other yes. class. Yes, that's the problem. The perfectionist problem. <laughs> yeah. And I am a recovering perfectionist and good for not you. Quite recovered, but nope. I'm working on it. <laughs> it's a daily struggle. Yeah. Uh, and I really do. I feel like my schooling is what ingrained that into me. I think part of it is just my natural way of being. But right. you know, I was a good student and I wanted mm-hmm. to please and I wanted to do well and I was intrinsically motivated to like be the top student, you know? Mm -hmm. And then once I got out of school, I was like, that was pointless. (laughs) (laughs) Why did I do that? Why did I I do that? Class rank in high school. Like I was 13 out Mm -hmm. of 400 something. And I was upset that I wasn't in the top 11 because that would have been the top 2%. And and in the end I was like, that would, it did not make any sense at all that I was so worried about that. But, and I I wasn't taught to fail. And then I get into the world and I start to fail and I'm like, I don't know how to deal with this. Yeah, right. And you'd think in school of all places when you have the safety net, right? Like, I mean, that is the safety net. Like, here's where you take risks. You'd think that is where we're preparing students for that. Because, you know, inevitably, if there's one thing in life that's going to happen is that you're going to make mistakes, right? Like, so learning how to deal with those and rather than trying to avoid them, right? Like all the time. I think is going to be a much more mentally and physically healthier strategy in the long run. It, oh, definitely. Yeah. Cause school, there is no risk, but we tell kids, Oh, you know, this grade will be on your permanent record. This behavior thing will, you know, you'll, you know, this right. will stick with you for the rest of your life. And it's like, no, not really. No, not really. <laughs> Once not you really. get into college, it's pretty yep. much all gone. <laughs> yeah, no. It's gone. Yeah. In fact, you get to do a lot of that stuff again. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, yeah, we need to get we need to change this. I think so. Yeah. Okay. So, now you mentioned the SLOs um mm-hmm. and assessment. What is do you think a good example of a measurable thing that an art teacher could measure that is more meaningful? Mhm. So what I really focus on these days are things like studio habits of of mind or dispositions. When I like to use a list of dispositions is think like an artist dispositions that come from the Columbus Museum of Art. They're very similar to the habits of mind. And what I love about, if you're not familiar with these, these are basically, I'm sure you're familiar, but for your your listeners, if you're not familiar with these, you know, they're evidence-based and they're essentially the skills and habits that are 
you know, that we have evidence for people developing through these artistic and creative experiences, right? So the studio habits of mind are things like expression, observation, idea generation, right? And I like ones from the list I mentioned where it's like tolerance for ambiguity and risk taking, right? And curiosity, right? Like those are awesome things. So I like focusing on those things. You know, they're compatible with standards. Like I feel like they're great umbrellas that you can fit sort of standards under. I like having, you know, clear sort of standards or things that students are trying to master. But I also like for students to have a little bit of choice maybe on what they get to work on. You know, it's not necessarily for me to decide all the things that they're going to work on because, you know, you can't work on everything. That's sort of that perfectionist tendency, right? Like do everything right. Like I'd rather have them focusing on what's important to them. It's like, uh, I use the analogy with my students of go, if I go to the gymnasium, which I desperately need to go to, I don't want someone walking up to me, somebody especially who's very fit coming up to me and telling me what I need to work on. That's not going to work. <laughs> That's not okay. So it's kind of like the same thing in the classroom. And, you know, you already heard me mention, you know, percentages in my class, like surveys and stuff like that. And, you know, things like the Likert scale, where it's like on a one to five rating, like, you know, how likely are you to do this? You know, those things aren't always the most reliable measures, but of course, there is no 100% sure measures. I mean, I have lots of research that shows that, you know, (laughs) one thing I could read you right here as far as just, you know, the way that we use grading in our classroom, grades do not give students, parents, or other educators accurate information about learning. That's a quote that comes from a research study that came out in 2016 right? Brookhart, Gusky et al., 100 years of grading research, right? (laughs) They were looking at, and this was one of the quotes that came out of that. So the things that we're measuring, you know, I just ask people to think about, you know, what's really important to them, what's meaningful, what's valuable. And for me, again, if I want to think long term, like 30 years from now, what's going to help that person in life? Well, maybe in school, if they had more opportunities to fail or to take risks, right, to try things that they didn't know were going to work, they're going to build courage. They're going to build bravery, right? They're going to become more courageous, right? And for me, expressing yourself, making artwork, being creative, that's, it requires vulnerability and it doesn't always feel good. It, you know, and often we avoid things that don't feel good, but I want my students to step into that discomfort, right? So getting back to your point, you know, as, as far as things that we can measure, we can definitely, you know, psychologists and all these sociologists and all these different, they have figured out ways to measure almost anything you can think of, believe me. And, you know, so that, those are the kinds of things that I'm looking for. I'm looking for my students to, you know, are you planning things? Are you sketching things in advance? Are you planning things in advance? Are you coming up with multiple ideas? You know, are you making something meaningful? Did you take any risks? Did you listen? Did you collaborate with anyone? Did you, did anything influence you or, you know, and these are all things that help in art. Sure. Absolutely. But I absolutely believe that they help you beyond art in other fields, right? Like, of course you want to collaborate with people in other fields, right? And of course, curiosity is going to be an important skill. So those are the things I think we can measure and, and we can do that. We can definitely do that. You're talking and I had a, an idea for something yeah. completely unrelated. So I'm going to write it down. Yeah, well, yeah, now, yeah. I have a, a course on my website and we were just recently writing a survey for the end of it. Mm-hmm. I was like, you know what? I really should add pre-survey to see yeah. like, where they are at the beginning, where they are after. And I was like, oh, yeah. I'm- It's so helpful. But just be prepared. Here's the thing is that it's scary asking those questions because you you sometimes get results that you don't want to see. I have that from this semester. I have it from last semester. All, you know, no matter how hard you're hitting things, trying to hit things, there's maybe you didn't ask the question the right way. You know, maybe it was the wrong word. I mean, that's assessment, right? It's like, oh my gosh, it's like when people feel this stress, I totally empathize, but it doesn't have to be that way. Like if people just understood that this is not a science, (laughs) teaching is an art, (laughs) right? You could ask a question a slightly different way and get a totally different answer, you know, and there needs to be room in there in, in what we do for that subjectivity, you know? Yeah, I love that. And I loved, I just really love the idea of using that scale, For things, because one of the things that you were saying when you were listing the habits of mind is you said tolerance for ambiguity. And I really like that one. I have not heard that one before. Yeah, students like that. My students respond to that one too. You know, they want that clear cut defined answer, right? That right Mm -hmm. answer. What's the right answer? What's tell me the right, you know? And and yes, I understand how, you know, just as a human, how uncertainty makes us feel stressed. But at the same time, that's not how the world works, right? Like it's Mm -hmm. all shades of gray. So, that's just something that, you know, is kind of one of my missions is just to kind of help them, you know, yeah. kind of step into that discomfort. Yeah, I love that because that is one thing I've never been good at either is just being in an unclear space in life. And so I yeah. think that's just a, and all of life is 
unclear, you know, right. like, so yeah. it, it's a good place to, to practice being in before you actually have to go out into the into world and live that every day. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that perspective taking, that's something that art helps us do, right? I mean, when you're looking at an artwork, you're looking at a human being's in a time and a place, their unique perspective on the world. And, and that's being reflected onto you in your particular place and space in the world. And, and that's just so incredibly powerful, I think. You know, again, that's what we do in the art classroom. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's fantastic. I love that. I love that I can look at an artwork one day and, and have a certain response to it. And then I come back two years later and see it again mm-hmm. and have different response to it because it is related to where you are in life and that's how Mm -hmm. I love like musical theater I'm a big musical theater junkie but like I'll see the same show you know multiple times and have a completely different emotional reaction depending on what has happening in my life at the time and I just I love that art just yeah that we can make okay so your quote about grading was awesome that it gives no like concrete Mm -hmm. information at all to anyone (laughs) (laughs) and I wrote down a quote from your blog which says I have no desire to sit and pass judgment on my students I'm just interested in helping people become creative collaborative and critical healthy human beings so Mm -hmm. in a world where we have to provide grades Mm -hmm. what should we do instead or how can we do this and make it meaningful yeah you know the grades again are something that you know, for me, in they're they're problematic in education just in general. The amount of it that we do, how much it affects our students, the often unhealthy ways I see it affects students. In the art room in particular, it's problematic. So we've known since the late 80s that when it comes to divergent thinking, things that undermine creativity, so that kind of thinking, would be things like time limits and things like expecting to be your work to be graded. And you know, when you know that, it makes you think differently about, you know, am I killing creativity by grading or grading too much? You know, I can't pretend that, you know, the vast majority of us under a system aren't required to Mm -hmm. put some kind of letter or number into the computer at the end of the day. And so that's the crux of it, right? So what do we do? We have that tension that some, we have research that says it's problematic. Do we just ignore that and do what the boss tells us to do? Well, that's, you know, that's not necessarily my style either. How do you find a compromise? So for me, it comes down to portfolios and authentic assessment, right? So it's something I work on very heavily with my students right now, again, because they're going to become future classroom teachers and they're going to be working with so many students in the future and affecting their lives positively. And if you're doing authentic assessment, for me, that means that in art, you're, you know, what's authentic? Well, for me, authentic in art is looking at what artists do and and looking at artworks, right? And in the art world, there's no grades. I mean, there's no rotten tomatoes for artworks or museums. There's no you know, if you go to a museum and you saw an A next to something or a B, I mean, that wouldn't help you enjoy your experience anymore. So I just take that back to the art room and I say, okay, so what do we do with that? Well, I just say, well, in art, you know, again, because I pursued an MFA and I've made art, it's all about conversations and learning what feedback to take and what feedback to leave and finding out how to make your own judgments and choices and and what's going to work for you. And so that's what I try and give my students. I try and give them room to make choices, to talk about the things they want to talk about, to plan the way, to plan things that are going to be meaningful for them and their students. And then, you know, they do lots of reflection. They do lots of writing. I am very, you know, I love writing. Even Mm -hmm. a lot of my older artwork has writing in it. And, you know, we take that and we have a meeting. And at the end of the semester, you know, we meet more than once, but at the end of the semester, we have our final meeting. And, you know, they come prepared. They've done all the reflections. They've collected evidence. They've gone through all their reflections and picked out, you know, when did I think this? When did I think that? What do I think now? And they tell me, you know, what changed for them? What did they, how did they grow? You know, what was their creative goal? Did they meet that goal? Did they exceed that goal? Are they still working on it? And we have a conversation about, I tell, they tell me what grade they think they earned based on the scale that I have to follow. And, and I tell them what grade I think they earned. And many of my students are really hard workers and they make my life easy because, you know, they're such hard workers and they do such good work for me that, those conversations often aren't awkward, but there are difficult and awkward conversations. And that's just part of being human, you know, trying to plan some kind of perfect system to like avoid all those sorts of uncomfortable situations. That's, you're missing a huge teachable moment for your students. And since I'm working with teachers, like I step into that with them because when they're working with a student in the future and they have to decide, wow, this student was absent for, you know, 
X number of days, like, so maybe in high school, like they were absent another day, but you know, they had this family emergency or they had, you know, something at home, like they're going to have to make these judgment calls, right? Like, Mm. oh, you know, what am I going to do in this situation? And so that's what I get to see when we meet, you know, they're sitting there in their seat, mulling things over. And, and oftentimes they're sort of actually more critical than I am, (laughs) you know, they, tendencies right there. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. So some of them are often pleasantly surprised that I think they did better than they think they did. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's not always the case. And sometimes you have to tell them, well, you actually, I know you really want that A, (laughs) you know, but that's not something any, you know, I delight in. It's not my, but it's such an important part of the job because, you know, you're never going to know what my belief is that I'm never going to be able to tell a hundred percent accurately judge myself. It's I'm biased. right? (laughs) And if someone else tries to judge me, they're not going to be able to do that a hundred percent because they don't know everything that's going on. So, you know, but if we come together, you know, we can, triangulate that we can work together and come up with something a little more fair right and that's kind of again just the story of artwork two people can look at an artwork have different opinions and that doesn't make one wrong and one right but you know somewhere in the middle there you know maybe there's you know there's that objective artwork still right so that's what I try and do with a grade like if we try and figure out what's the fairest you know, way of reaching that objective letter or number right because that's what goes in the grade book <laughs> well one thing too as you're talking and I keep this keeps happening when you're talking as I'm thinking of the student. And as you said, like 30 years from now, what is going to be meaningful to them? Mm-hmm. And the conversations that you're having with the students are teaching them how to have those conversations in their future. Because I think about, you know, I know you're working with teachers, but even, you know, if you're working with students, you're not going to become teachers. Like when they want to get a raise at their job. Yes. And- when they're on a job interview and when they're someone mistreats them and they need to have a a rough conversation and they don't know how to do it. Like you're teaching them how to have those conversations and the the awkward conversations and the tough conversations and grades can become an easy way to become objective and to just assign a number. And, but I love that you're using that as a teachable moment because I really, that's powerful because those are skills, especially like women and girls, like we don't know how to do that. Yeah. You know, We don't know how to advocate for ourselves. I think Mm. I don't want to speak for all women as a whole, but like in general, you know, women get paid less and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So teaching people how to talk about themselves and, and, and also we're taught to downplay our accomplishment, Mm. you know, like the shameless self-promotion, like there should be no shame in (laughs) being proud of what you're doing. And so like this helps take that away. I think this helps, you know, embrace the awkward. And I love that. Well, I love that. Embrace the awkward. That's a great saying. I might have to start using that one. I think, you know, the big crux of it for me though, is, is, is making it work for the classroom. Right. And like, you know, it does take time. It is slower. I'm convinced that we can make it work, but you know, it is very tough because again, our system very much focuses on the fast and the furious, like getting through as quickly as possible, you know, and you know, finding ways to resist that though, is, is the art of what we do, you know? (laughs) <laughs> did you ever, I used to tell my students in elementary school and middle school, I would tell, well, even at all ages, actually, I would tell them, Mr. O'Donnell's mind doesn't work in a straight line. So like, if I, if I, if you ask me a question, I wander off somewhere and I'm helping somebody else. And you're just like, what the, you know, like it wasn't personal. I just completely forgot what you asked me <laughs> and got distracted. And I'll remember five minutes from now, I'll run back very yep. concerned. <laughs> yep. Nope. Yep. I think, well, this is just the multitasking element. Yeah. You know, it's like you're trying to deal with, you know, 20 different people at the same time. I mean, even with my own children, I do that. I'm like, they'll both be asking me the same question, a different question at the same time. And I'm like, I don't, and I'm trying to do something else. So I don't (laughs) Okay, yeah. so I had two ways to take this. One, One is more strategical. And then the other one is I really love the idea of slowing down because Mm -hmm. that fast and furious nature that you were talking about, because (laughs) um, when I tell people you know, about including works of art in their classroom. They're like, oh, well, that's going to slow down the process of, uh, I don't know, we're not going to get as many projects done that year, right? Yeah. So I'm like, well, does it matter that you get one less project, one fewer project done that year? Like, Mm -mm. you're you're adding in more value. And I, you know, I'll spend one, two, three class periods on one work of art, and we just keep doing different activities about it. And I'm like, I think that's so powerful and so meaningful to, to students because, instead of lecturing for three days and they've got like 50 facts that they have to regurgitate and memorize that they've connected with something that another human has made and they have, you know, and then they'll remember that, you know, for a long, so I think 
we have that luxury in art to slow down and teach students to slow down because that's another, again, where I'm thinking of the adults that were forming. And I'm like, I don't know how to slow down. Like I do not stop. And I'll sit there and I'll get antsy and I'll start to shake. And I'm like, I got to get up and do something. Yeah. And that's not healthy. I'm trying to to stop doing that. But you know, I'm 37 years old and I'm like, I still don't know how to slow down. Yeah, absolutely. And when you're thinking about, you know, just how prevalent, you know, mental health and, and mental wellness and mindfulness is these days, you know, again, we can do that as art. Like, I'm not saying we're the silver bullet, but we do that. Like, that's our thing. We can help you with this. Yeah. But what gets to most people, I guess, is that, you know, like, for example, with classroom management, right? Like, you're going to struggle with classroom management if you don't spend enough time working on it right at the beginning, you know? So I might have like two, you know, like when I was teaching elementary and you only see them maybe once a week, right? I might spend two, maybe even three, who knows, like class periods going over, you know, just kind of doing the get to know you and setting the tone and showing them how everything works. And, but then that means that I almost never have to do it again. Meanwhile, I've been in some classrooms where, you know, high school students are asking, where's the paper? You know, like, and it's like, oh, dear God, like it's April. <laughs> like, why don't you know where the paper is? You know, so that's an example of slowing down, but like art, you know, and I just actually wrote about this a little bit, like art requires the, you mentioned luxury. It's the imperative, I would say, of art is to slow us down. You know, it's like a cross in the street, right? Like maybe sometimes it's just like, instead of just go, 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 it's like, stop, you know, it's like, go look both ways or stop, look both ways and then go, right? Like just Mm -hmm. even pausing can be powerful for people. So like art, you know, asks us to slow down. It asks us to notice something. It asks us to, it's, I might even call it demanding, right? It won't just give you something just like, you know, in a second, but that's the culture we live in, right? Like the internet and the instant gratification and the, and the smartphone is, is my favorite example. Like I hold this up in front of students. I was like, this will never ask you to slow down. It will never ask you to think. It will always give you what you want immediately, and you'll never have to think about anything ever again. (laughs) But but we have to slow down. You know, it's more important. You know, obviously, we have to cover, we want to cover a certain amount of things. But if students forget those things, then what was the point, right? And we're competing with all the other classes. We're competing with everything else in their life. We're competing with the entire internet, (laughs) all the video games, and we don't have time not to slow down. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. I love, oh my goodness. That is so good. And I am going to try to create a mantra for myself to slow down and I'm going to write it on my desk somewhere. <laughs> I'm like, I really need to focus on this. Wow. That's great. Me okay. Too. So my second thing that you were talking about when you were talking about grading, and this is, I'm wondering what your opinion is on grading on effort. Like how much of effort do you incorporate? So that is such an interesting question because I, again, I just, I literally was just writing about this. I just posted this yesterday. And so in my meetings with my students, right, let me get back to the classroom. So with my students who are future teachers, let me tell you that if there was one universal principle in their evaluation of themselves, it was effort. If mm-hmm. there was one thing that every student held up almost first above all other things, it was I put a lot of effort in this class. Now, let me temper that by saying they did put a lot of effort in this class. Like I make, like I ask for a lot and I know I do, but I establish the classroom community. I make it relevant. I make it meaningful. And I build those relationships that make them want to, you know, do that, you know, and it's not difficult work. It's just, you know, a lot of thinking and a lot of slowing down and a lot of reflecting. Anyway, getting back to my mind was starting to get off on a train of thought. But so they were holding up effort every time. And and what I would say to them, I didn't have time to say this to every student, but what I would say to them is, you know, effort is something that I can't necessarily see. Like I can know if you're like, Mm -hmm. teachers are very good at knowing if you're engaged or not. Right. But take, for example, the person who tries to move a boulder with their bare hands. And if there's a person trying to move that boulder with their bare hands, they can put a million hours into that and all the effort into the world. And it's not going to make a lick of difference. But if a person uses a little bit of knowledge, maybe a little bit of research, you know, ask some people, maybe he does some, maybe they're very clever and they invent something, they might come up with a lever and they might use that lever to actually move the boulder and it didn't require as much effort, right? So this is a, I think this is a sort of a problematic area of education in general is that, you know, when we grade based on effort, it's, that's a non-academic for me. I feel like in general, like our classroom culture, right, should embrace effort, right? Like, Obviously, we don't want anyone in the classroom not showing effort like that. Like, I don't think anyone would tolerate that. No one advocates for that at all. But 
how are you going to judge fairly the student who came up with a clever solution for a problem versus the student who just muscled their way through it? Me, when I'm doing math problems, I feel like Hercules. Like I am feeling like I'm <laughs> lifting mountains trying to get this stuff done and figured out, right? All the stuff I'm doing, writing down. Like I, I mean, I've never felt like especially gifted in the intellectual realm, but I feel like I put a lot of work in there. But again, like if someone is a little more clever and they figure out a creative solution to the problem, right? I mean, that's evolution. I mean, that's like, that. don't we advocate for that? Like, like coming up problem solving and aren't we always trying to figure out the easier way to do something? I mean, that's technology, right? Like we have light bulbs because setting fires in your house is difficult, is challenging, right? So it's like, so anyway, I don't have the solution, but I do try personally to avoid effort. Like if you put no effort in, then that's a problem. And that's something we're going to talk about. But as far as grading that, putting that on a report card, I mean, like I tell my students, I need to see it to believe it. And if I can't, you know, if I'm not a psychic, I don't actually, there's no way to know how much effort you put in to something. But I can see, you know, if I have a standard, you know, <laughs> if I have, if I have some kind of evidence or proof that you made something that you showed me that you could do it. Yeah. Now we're talking. It's, it kind of goes back to, okay, so it's kind of corny, but it just goes back to one of my favorite franchises, which is quote from there, which is, you know, do or do not, there is no try. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and that comes from Yoda <laughs> and from Star Wars. And, and my most successful art classes I ever taught, frankly, were ones that were run by that mantra. Like, do these things. I don't know if they're going to work or not. Like, they might come out looking awful, but that's not what I'm going to judge you on. I'm going to judge you on, did you do it? Did you see what happens? You know, like mm -hmm. trying, like, you know, anybody with kids knows what kids' definition of trying is. Like, you know, they like, here, try this food. Like, but, <laughs> you know, like, that's, yeah. yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. That's not exactly what I was talking about with trying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know that's one of my favorite mantras too, because I think, well, I, you know, I study business and stuff a lot, you know, through my website. And one of the things that they say is the most key to having a successful business is not trying to, <laughs> it's, it's just doing it. Like, and yeah. most people, They'll think of the idea and they'll think of it for two years and then they might dabble in it, but they don't actually do it and you keep doing it. And then yeah. eventually it works out. You know, it's just people always give up too yeah. soon. Yeah. And I think that's what we call an investment, yeah. <laughs> like a commitment, you know, like yeah, committing to the, yeah, the commitments. Yeah, you're right. I think we do. That's a great point. We do have to ask for a little bit of that upfront, right? Mm -hmm. Like just trying maybe maybe just isn't enough sometimes. <laughs> like yeah. just do it. It might not work, but I'm proud of you for doing it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had, okay. The reason I get, not confused, but I get my past self gets upset about the grading on effort thing because I took a drawing class in college. Mm -hmm. I have an art history major. So I had to take four studio art classes in college. Now I think I took five or six, but mm -hmm. I had to take four. And one of them was drawing and I loved it. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not, but I'm not a naturally gifted drawer. Like I yeah. can draw something if I'm looking at it, like I can draw it and the proportions are good or whatever, but I'm not good at the modeling and stuff like that. So I tried mm -hmm. so hard. Like yeah. I so hard. And then we had my meeting at the end with all my drawings and we sat on the hall with the professor and he was like, you are the hardest worker in this class. Like he was yeah. like, you worked very, very hard. And he gave me a B. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, I tried. Right? So, okay. So what does that even mean? <laughs> it's like, you can be the hardest worker in this entire place. And that's not good enough. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, but that girl who was like next to me, who was just gifted beyond belief like she could just like puke out beautiful drawings like, <laughs> and I don't know how she did it and I would watch her and I'd be like yeah. I don't know how she is doing that like I could not figure yeah. it out yeah. but he wasn't spending any time with her because she already knew how to do it he would spend a lot of time helping me and yeah. I would try to, to incorporate what he was doing and then I got a B and I was like oh and again yeah. the B didn't matter in the long run of my life but I was just so pissed off you know I had, I had a similar experience with that but like with you know, I'm a drawer and I love drawing and I love teaching drawing. But the thing is, you know, your experience is just so common, right? It's like folks who are trying this out for the first time, right? Or, you know, it's that lack of differentiation, right? Like we have in the college class, especially like you'll have kids who've never taken our class in their entire life. And they're saying, 
I want to be an artist. And then you have kids coming in there who have like, you know, won, you know, scholastic awards and stuff. And they're like, I want to be an artist. It's like, there is room for both of you. You both can be artists, but you know, this person over here, their drawing is going to be on a slightly different curve than this person over here where I might focus on, you know, if, you know, I don't really like those words gifted or talented, but like if they have greater ability in realistic drawing, then maybe what they need to be doing is divergent drawing. They need to be doing as much different kind of drawing as possible, right? Whereas this person, they need the Betty Edwards approach, you know, they need to just be kind of hunkering down and learning how to get that basic observation skill, right? But there's, you know, there's room for both in the art world. Like we can totally, both could be A's. It's just, you know, how that's the fairness that I'm talking about. Like, how do you judge these t- apples and oranges in your classroom and give them both like under this yeah. one umbrella? And I think too, the key is not judging the students based on the yeah, other peers. It's you're judging it based on right. how have grown. So right. if you saw my first drawings and I took high school art and I was fine at, but like if you saw my first drawings in that class to the ones at the end, the progress is huge. Yeah. You know, and I'm sure the other girl did not have that big of a change mm-hmm. in her art, you know? So yeah, it's interesting. I think we should, it should be individualized in art because there's no way you can't set this, like your drawings will look like this at the end, you know, that yeah. doesn't work that way in our subject. No, no it, it really doesn't. Yeah. And having that experience, you know, like I told you, I was not a product of an art education per se. I had a couple, I had a few art classes in high school, but when I got to college, I learned the hard way that I didn't know how to draw. Yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> I, the way I taught myself how to draw was from comic books, right? So mm-hmm. it was lots of bubble people and stuff. And then I get to college and they're talking about, you know, observing and looking at life drawing and contour. What's a contour? Like I've, and I had to basically just start from scratch. And that was such a humbling experience for me, yeah. you know. But anyway, you know, it's definitely a struggle. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and one more thing I want to say. Sure. I think we're getting close to the end because we've been talking for almost an hour. But it's gone by fast. Yeah, it's awesome. I could talk to you forever. So the thing you had said about the boulders, I thought was so good about, you mm-hmm. know, coming up with the solution. And take. I always hear people say like, oh, you took the easy way out. And you didn't, you'll p- still see people judged for taking the easy way yeah. rather than the hard way. And I'm like, what is wrong with taking the easy way, (laughs) you know? (laughs) I mean, for an example, to get personal, like I had weight loss surgery like a few years Mm -hmm. ago and I didn't experience any judgment from it, but other people that I know did. And it's like, oh, you took the easy way out. You didn't just buckle down and exercise harder. (laughs) Count calories more. I'm like, no, this was really the only way out of that situation. And it was the still very hard, but it was I mean, a lot of people got mad that they're like, oh, it's the easy way. But I'm like, it was hard and it's okay that it was still easier. Like, I don't know. I'm just rambling. But I think it's okay to take the easy way out sometimes. And I think and- it is. I mean, it's, it's not a character flaw, yeah. <laughs> right? Right. I mean, like if you were a programmer, right? If you were a programmer, oh. God help you if you're not trying to find the easy way to do things. I mean, like as teachers, right? Like, are we not trying to find often like the easy way to manage this or the easier way to... Yeah, I mean, that's just the monkey in us, right? Like, how do I get that banana without, you know, like a little bit easier than everybody else? It's, yeah, we often get into these value judgments with folks and, you know, see it as a character flaw, you know, and frankly, again, going back to the grades, if you tell people that you're going to evaluate them in advance, you better believe that they're going to take the path of least resistance. They're not going to go for like, oh, let me create the, you know, the American masterpiece of literature, you know, or something like that. They're not going to, you know, in this class, because what they're focused on is I have to get an A in this class so that I can blah, 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 right? So that I can just get out of this class. But like, you know, if we take that away, then, you know, maybe people are a a little more okay with maybe not always taking the easy way. You know, it's not a judgment. It it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And the coding thing, that's hilarious because I, yeah, you'll see a my code. Like I took a software, I learned, taught myself to code a few years ago. And That's awesome. Wow. Look at that. I love it. It's so fun. But I was going to change careers and then yeah. I, you know, that was, I'm not going to do that. But you look at Still mine. Still really helpful. It's like the long, I took, you know, everything I did was like the long way to get something done. And then you have a, another coder who's been doing it for years and he just like, oh, it's like four lines of code. Oh, it's just, yeah, yeah. And it's like, oh my God. They end up in the same, doing the same thing. So it's like, his is better. <laughs> yeah, I know. God, if I didn't learn the hard way, I wouldn't have learned anything at all. I mean, everything I do, I've got to do it like you said, like <laughs> I got to do it the hard way. <laughs> all right. Well, I had this other topic of art from other cultures, but I think 
that would be a little bit too long for the okay, sure. podcast. But I love yeah, that. that if you ever want to come back and do another one? I would that. love to anytime. Yeah. Thank you so much for this interview. I really enjoyed talking with you. Oh, thank you, Cindy. It's been my pleasure. Yeah. So can you tell our listeners how they can connect with you online, can link to your blog and, and your favorite social media? Sure. So you can find me at killyourcolorwheels.com. And so that's where my blog is, where I write about what goes on in my class and research that I'm doing. And you can find me on Facebook at Kill Your Color Wheels as well. I'm on social media like Instagram and Twitter. I go by Art Teacher Teacher. But, you know, definitely uh, the blog is the best place to find me, I think. Yeah. And the blog posts are good. They're long, but they are like mm -hmm. really meaty and interesting. Yeah. And yeah. I, 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 like I get deep. I always <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's an investment. <laughs> yes. Yeah, like, he, may, he must really take some time writing these. So. I, I just don't do much else. So, you know, that's that's the sacrifice. <laughs> yeah. I understand that. Okay. Yep. So my last question, which I ask all my guests, is mm -hmm. which artwork changed your life? So I think I'm like you. I think you said that you, there's so many that you could think of, right? And it's like, well, at what point in my life? At what time? <laughs> yeah, but uh, if I could go back, I would say probably my first encounter with, you know, what I would call a work of quote unquote fine art. And my first encounter, and this is why it's so important what we do, because there's so many kids all over the country who live very far from a museum, who, who may in their entire life not have an opportunity to go to a museum in their neighborhood, you know, that's close by or, or see an artwork in yeah. person in a gallery. So when I was in middle school, maybe sixth grade or so, one of the upper grades was having a fundraiser and they were actually selling little reproductions of artworks. And, you know, they were just, you know, a picture glued to a mat board and they were selling them for like a couple of bucks. So I was looking through them and I found, you know, and one just leapt out at me. It just stunned me. And it was a, this painting of an angel. It's by an artist. It's called a winged figure. It's a, by an artist, American artist that not a lot of people maybe would know off by their name, but <laughs> that I'm even forgetting right now. Oh. Abbott Henderson Thayer. Oh, <laughs> I'm winged sorry. figure is also Barbara Hepworth as I'm gotcha. Ooh. All right. So this is a painting of this angel. She's seated on a cloud. It's, she's resting her head against her wing and she has her hand on her chest. And for me, I did go to religious school for a while growing up. And, and this was a different depiction than I'd ever seen. You know, she mm -hmm. seemed, she has this very enigmatic expression. She seems, you know, angelic, of course, but also very maybe tired or, or forlorn. I can't even quite describe it. And when I saw that, the time I had a very conflicted relationship with my mother and who was, she was my single parent at the time. And, and the way the angel's hair was pulled back in a bun and with her dark hair and her fair skin, it just kind of, it just kind of reminded me of my mother and it kind of helped me see her in this sort of allegorical way, maybe like as someone who had these, you know, something troubling them, you know, that pain, I still have that picture today. If you can believe oh, wow. it. it was just something that immediately sort of stuck out to me and just connected with me. And, and when I saw it later in person at the Chicago Institute of Art, I mean, I, I spent so much time sitting in front of it and it's just a beautiful experience. It's, that's the kind of experience, you know, that just having postcards in your classroom, art postcards in your classroom, you could provide for your students, you know, like you just never know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I Googled the painting as you were talking and it is beautiful. We'll put it in the show notes, but I can sure. see that it's just I love really emotional art because sure. I'm just an emotional person. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I really, really like this one too because you're just like, what is she going through? You know, yeah. and it just looks like, and I love that, like seeing your mother's humanity, you know, because yeah. as a kid, you, you don't necessarily see your parents as people. They're yeah. just parents. And so their struggles are related to you. It's mm -hmm. all, you always internalize whatever's going on, but like you don't necessarily realize that they're also going through something pretty they could be going through something pretty terrible and, yeah, and absolutely. To anything terrible. I love that. Like I can definitely see that. It's beautiful. Ah, good yeah. story. I love these stories so much. Yeah. Okay. I think that's such a great <laughs> question. I'm so glad you asked it. Yeah. I, it's, it's, it's so cool. I'm getting such great answers because it's like, and, and people have emailed me too. And they've said, you know, I hadn't thought about it. I didn't think I had an artwork that changed my life. Right. And they sat and think about it. And then they found one, they figured one yeah. out and they're like, Oh yeah, I remember, you know, and even my friend who is not an art 
person or a teacher. She's just my friend. She said she thought about it and she came up with one too. You know, it's like she found, you, you think of things that you connect with personally and they're meaningful yeah. to you and that's wonderful. And just to make one more point, you just hit something so, so important because at the end of the day, as teachers, sometimes just the most important thing we can possibly do with our students is just ask the question, right? Uh, yes. <laughs> you know? Other, because those people, like you said, had never even considered such a thing, right? And, and you gave them that opportunity to make that connection. So that's awesome. I could imagine you doing like a cut of all these, you know, like all those, oh. right? Oh, that's a good idea. I even, I was thinking about too, asking people to send in voicemails. Yeah. Like, oh, what a good idea. Yeah. Let's, on this. Let's ask them to do that officially. Yeah. Now. Listeners of this podcast, <laughs> send in your voicemails and I will figure out how to do that. And yeah. I will give you some instructions in a little That's bit. That's an awesome I'll idea. Add it on to the end because then we can add, I can tack those on at the end too and be like yeah. stories from everyone else. So absolutely, they do that on this other podcast I listen to this Harry Potter podcast, but I love it. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> they read Harry Potter as if it's a sacred text. Really good. <laughs> <laughs> I got to check that. Out. You it's called Harry Potter <laughs> sacred text, and it is if you're a Harry Potter fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Well, and even my friend who hadn't read Harry Potter, she's seen the movies. She's she got hooked on it too. She's reading and listening. yeah, it sounds like you're reading along with them, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I know. Okay. Well, thank you so much again. It was, yeah. it was excellent. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for listening. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and give us an honest rating on iTunes. This will help other teachers find us and hear these amazing stories. Do you want even more art inspiration? Sign up for Art Class Curator's once a week email newsletter, your weekly art break. Teacher Sarah Warnock says, I truly do take a break from my busy week to check all your links and feel inspired. Everything you share is relevant, meaningful, and also super helpful. You definitely help me become a better art teacher, and I look forward to your emails each week. You can sign up at artclasscurator.com slash artbreak. And as a free gift for subscribing, you'll get six free art interpretation worksheets to use in your classroom. Be sure to tune in next week for more inspiring art interviews. What about you? Have you thought about an artwork that changed your life? If you have and you want to share it with your fellow podcast listeners, visit artclasscurator.com slash podcast and click on submit a story to send in a voice memo. You can also email it to cindy at artclasscurator.com. You can just record a voice memo on your phone and send it by email right from your phone. And if you have an iPhone, you can just record your story with your voice memo app on your iPhone and you can email it right from your phone. I can't wait to hear from you. Thank you so much to Jim for his passionate leadership and teaching in arts education. He is blessing his students and the art ed community with his thoughtful work. You better believe he will be back on the podcast to get to all of the topics we couldn't cover this time, including art critique games and tips for teaching non-Western cultures. Be sure to check out the show notes at artclasscurator.com slash nine to learn more about Jim's work and everything we talked about today. On the next episode of the Art Class Curator podcast, I have a heart to heart about working at low income schools with two fabulous and inspiring women, Amy Bull- Tina and Danette Albino. Keep listening to hear a preview of my interview with Amy and Danette. You know, teaching in a Title I school is a is a 150% job on a good day, you know. Yeah. On a bad day, it's like 250%. You know, so if you don't take care of yourself, you're going to be a real horrible person for those kids. So, you know, I, I think that we have to start looking at that like it's okay to take care of yourself.